I'll do my best to finish earlier than 20 minutes, but uh, hopefully we will hit that target. I'd like to initial, initially make, start my comments with the notion of crisis-ready institutions. Uh, Peter mentioned the notion of potential groupthink. Um, crisis-ready organisations, for many of you who know the literature well about decision-making under crisis conditions, one of the elements that I'm starting to warm to, and, and it wasn't something that was focused in my mind, was the notion of match readiness. If I Forgive me for the, for the, uh, the sporting metaphor, but um, Prime Minister Howard, your team was in place and you were in a leadership position for a long period of time. And the notion of steadiness, the hand on the tiller, another metaphor, the ability to be in a balanced context when calamity or uncertainty and confusion and a range of options are on the table for consideration. Many organisations historically in the literature on disasters in, in commercial contexts and institutional failure, be they legal, be they policy or otherwise, in many cases it's a case of the senior leadership team are not ready to make decisions. They're not practised at dealing with the adversity and the confusion and uncertainty that manifests in front of them. So in positioning my comments today about do governments learn, do institutions learn? But what do they do with the learning, assuming that there is some? So the first half of my presentation will be a little bit of technicality. You know, you can't get the academic out of me. I've been doing academics for some time, but I did learn different things when I was with, uh, with, with ASPE. I learned how not to be an academic. Um, I think it ruined my academic career. Peter, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, then I want to go through certain things that have occurred, instances where the learning has caused things to have occurred through the period of uh, Prime Minister Howard's time at the top. One of the contexts about failure is that oftentimes things occur that people cannot understand. There's too much noise in the system, there's too much confusion, there are too many things happening. And a critical element of being crisis ready is that the thinking and the decision making process is slowed down, there's a steady acquisition of information, data, what does it mean? The notion of sense making. So in institutional failure contexts, making sense of what is happening is critical. So in the notions of national, the, the National Committee of Cabinet, Peter, as you alluded to, having a steady hand, an ordered process of making sense of what decisions could be made, what decisions have to be made, and the bases upon which those decisions are made is a critical thing. So there seems to be a balance between effective governance at a national level and effective institutional crisis readiness and decision making. So there seems to be... I think a very interesting balance between what we have seen in the history of business failures, institutional failures, legislative failures, and success when it comes to making decisions at a government level. So in some cases, you know, historically we know that in, you know, many, many failures have occurred in the last 100 years. Historical analyses of these failures have suggested that 80% of them were caused by socio-technical failure as in decisions that are made without the full suite of information relevant to the endpoints of the, those decisions. In many cases, there's been just normal accidents occurring. And one of the interesting historical analyses of the, the Challenger space shuttle failures has been this notion of normal accidents, that once a, a system becomes overly complex, people or the administrators, the decision makers, lose sense of what is happening in the system that they're governing or managing. So accidents become normalised. You have to expect these uncertainties, these cracks in the system, to manifest as failures, some of them larger, some of them smaller. So the idea of normal accidents, emergent phenomena where the governing system fails, Maybe the, the system or the, those individuals involved in the governing process have lost sense of what it is they're governing. The crisis-prone factors within their operating system allows these errors to occur. But the critical thing is, if we're looking at surprise management 
in, in some cases, risk management could be construed as surprise management. Expand some of those ideas to the level of a national governance arrangement. And we have national surprise management. And I think if we ask the question of do governments learn? Do systems learn? How can we make sense of the complexity that we're dealing with? And how can we then make sure that we manifest appropriate decision-making processes and the governance arrangements that allow betterment to occur most of the time? So if we add the complexity beyond the necessary uh, issues of uh, national security in the sense of war fighting, uh, near-term or near-regional governance arrangements, policy issues of that sort, if we add the complexity of the way in which we govern, we rely on computerised technologies, the ubiquity of the internet, wireless connectivity, hardwired connectivity, a, a range of ICT security issues. We add to that weather vol, uh, variability where we have a range of problems that are occurring. We have issues of the, 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 the drought that we've uh, lived through in this country for many, many, many years. We have the notions of that one day it's dry, the next day it's flood. I know colleagues in northern New South Wales now are currently working specifically about how to reduce the deep vulnerability that continually manifests from rain events and flooding in that part of New South Wales. And again, there are reviews into Resilience New South Wales. Again, this notion of how many reviews do we need? There's always going to be a review after a major disaster of natural hazard related uh, disaster. But the critical thing I'd like to suggest to you all is that sometimes events happen so quickly and they're so confusing that they're out of the box. We can't understand. We have to chase the decision space. Where can we intervene in what's going wrong? And in some cases, that sense-making is critical. The ideas of having an effective decision-making regime attached to what you do with the decisions, whether you take them proactively or whether there's a passive reaction to a decision space, is critical. And in the second part of my presentation, uh, I want to talk about certain events through time and certain things that were done. The idea of an authorising environment, the steady hand, the match fitness of Prime Minister Howard's cabinet, is critical in terms of what we see from a decision to what happens once that decision is made and things that occur that are sustained through time and are, I would argue, evidence of very effective decisions. Once the decision is made, someone has to implement it in a range of particular uh, manners and in certain areas. Some of the examples will be state-based that I've lived through and experienced in Queensland and other places. But the critical thing is, if you make a decision, what do you do with it? What is the evidence of a decision? that's effective through time. So I'd like to touch on a few of those issues. I'm having a bit of trouble with the slides. Here we go. One of the things that we know from the literature and historical analyses of disasters is there a thing I would suggest I call a failure fractal. We have, in retrospect, recognition that there are pre-crisis phenomena, some trigger occurs, a crisis ensues, consequences and post-consequences occur, and theoretically, we learn things. And in terms of royal commissions and various other types of commissions of inquiry, we have a mechanism to learn. But a problem with uh, human systems and the way humans operate is that we have a tendency, I think, to forget more than we remember. So those learnings are often ephemeral, they're short-term, and in terms of, of, of politics, the reality is that there's always another crisis that needs to have a decision or at least engagement uh, uh, about. So this failure fractal appears in the literature in disaster and crisis response. The critical thing for me is that if we have effective decision and we learn, how do we manifest sustained foci on learning? And do we actually change the preconditions for those crises? how they manifest. Do we actually implement change in the most appropriate ways? A critical thing. Oops, gone the wrong way. So one example of the failure fractal, if many of you remember Bearings Bank, 
Prime Minister, how did you have any money in? <laughs> no, I didn't have any money. <laughs> I've heard a rumour Peter Jennings had a lot of money in bearings. <laughs> but the Queen had money in bearings. And the critical thing there was that following that pattern of, of failure fractals, there were preconditions where Nick Leeson was doing front and back end of his office in Singapore. He was supposedly managing the, the daily uh, governance of, of, of the future's front end of the office. But allegedly, he had a relationship with a young trader and it was a friendly relationship. I don't think it was anything untoward. But this young trader was making lots of losses. The bets weren't accurate. So Nick decided to assist by doing a little bit of over the fence from back office to front office work, supporting and, and, and basically balancing the losses coming through. Now, the trigger of all of these things, and Nick was reporting back to head office that there was massive amounts of profit coming out of his particular branch of bearings, it's certainly the trading side of bearings. Unfortunately, there were signs that it was going pear-shaped because various uh, auditing um, commissions within Singapore, government uh, regulators, were picking up signs that things weren't right. The trigger was the Kobe earthquake. Again, unexpected events causing cascading impacts through systems. Global trading systems are not connected physically. They're connected through internet connectivity as the sun moves around the earth, end of a day's trading starts at another part of the planet. So the Kobe earthquake shut down the trading houses and all bets were off the table. So they discovered the problems, cascading effects, the learning minimal other than the fact that bearings had to sell their brand to a, a European entity. Similarly with the, uh, the uh, Bank of uh, Credit Commerce International. If we're going to learn things, we have to also be cognizant of what's happened in the past and bring those lessons into the capacity to make a decision in the current time, and then project forward what are we doing about those decisions. If we look at technology, I quite like technology. Uh, we don't have an Office of Technology Assessment in Australia. Uh, the Americans used to have one, but uh, foolishly, I think they got rid of that some years ago. Technology is a commodity that we invest in. We use technology. But do we fully understand what that technology could do in a counterintuitive form into the future? And this particular image uh, is, a, is a foil for some of my thoughts about the complexity, the uncertainty, the ambiguity of decision space. In many cases, we don't understand fully the connections, the interdependencies between certain phenomena that are party to a decision. There is sometimes lack of certainty about you know, the data points that we're using in terms of our decision making, and there's always ambiguity about things. So there's a range of issues that we can have surprise-free use of technology. We can have problems with the, the nature of uh, uh, technological surprise, and then we can have context where the endpoints of a certain application of a technology is completely outside of our control. The genie is out of the box. So the notion of decision making and learning can be made a little bit less likely by complexity, uncertainty and the ambiguity of the context within which those decisions need to be made and the expediency in the timeline of which these things have to be put in place. So I think when it comes to these sorts of decisions and related to the notion of risk management, surprise management, there are a range of questions that can be asked. What can happen? How could it occur and what can we do to mitigate those cascading effects? And I think from a surprise management, from a national perspective, a risk management perspective, these are very simple questions and they're probably some of the top level questions that senior decision team needs to consider. But may I suggest that there's a little bit more complexity involved in this, but as a beginning position, if we don't have that inquisitorial thought, what could occur? we won't be able to respond to the things that do occur, assuming that we really see them coming. They could be slow burn events, they could be fast kick events. Again, one of the problems that we all face is that sometimes we don't appreciate the ignorance with which we come to a decision space. In many cases, we may find that we're dealing with known unknowns, uh, known knowns, or we're in deep uncertainty. 
in that particular quadrant in the top right hand corner here. A critical issue of a decision making process is that you have the best information possible, but you also have as much imagination and inquisitorial, uh, the notion of what could happen. Do we fully understand? Are we getting the right information that we need from the right sources? Or do we block out certain sources of information, people, because we don't like them or we don't like their historical presentation of information? And one example of not necessarily fully appreciating the information sources. The second, uh, before the Second uh, War kicked off in the Pacific, the Flying Tigers in China, uh, a slightly aberrant group of people, uh, the Army Air Force in the American space, flying against the Zero Fighter before it started to manifest as active warfare. They reported back to Washington that they discovered a new Japanese fighter plane that was totally different, more advanced than anything they'd seen before, and it was a worry, it was a threat, an emergent threat. Chanel was a pariah. No one believed him in Washington. They ignored his reports right up until Pearl Harbor when the Americans discovered the Zero Fighter. So the critical thing here for decision making, do, do governments learn, is do governments accept information from sources that may not be always the most popular source of information? A critical thing. I'd like now just to, to go back to a few issues to talk about events that have occurred through the period of time of uh, the uh, Prime Minister Howard's time at the top. But before I do that, there was reference earlier today, very, very, very good presentation about uh, inquiries, Royal Commissions, etc. Between 1927 and 2020, there were 242 inquiries related to natural hazards and disasters related to those particular sources. From the year 1995 to 2007, there were 31 bushfire related inquiries, one cyclone inquiry, 15 all hazards, two floods, two tsunamis. Most of those were Victoria and New South Wales. Certainly bushfires in Victoria and, and certainly flooding in New South Wales would be critical to those particular numbers. The point here, though, is that they were not royal commissions. Some of them were coronial inquiries. Some of them were government-sponsored. Some of them were audited or auditor-related. Some were independent and some were within government agencies in terms of their foci. But the critical thing here is they all provided information flows to inform decision-making. Some of them would have been implemented, as we would have heard, uh, as we have heard earlier today. There's a variety of things that are often not implemented immediately or take time for that to occur. But some of the events I'd like to talk about specifically uh, through the time. March 1995, the sarin gas attack uh, in Kasumi Kaseki. Uh, station in Tokyo. Uh, Prime Minister, you were leader of the opposition at this stage, I think. But it wasn't so much the sarin gas attack, it's what happened in Australia at that time. The first international standard on risk management was activated in that year, the AZNS 4360. Again, Australia made that decision to create that particular guidance that have formed decision making related to risk issues. 1997, the Threadbow landslide. What triggered, what followed that particular event? Well, we find that we have the INSARAG, the International Search and Rescue Advisory Group, was uh, contacted by, I think, New South Wales Fire and Rescue and New South Wales Police. Certainly Victoria was involved. And that resulted in two heavy USAR groups, urban search and rescue groups in New South Wales and Queensland being stood up and sustained to this day. The Sydney Olympics, uh, one, of the, one of my historical elements was auditing the chemical, biological, radiological tests before the Sydney Olympics in terms of emergency response, assuming that there could be a terrorist attack during the Olympic Games. Now, there was an emphasis on learning by doing. There was an emphasis in terms of focusing the response agencies to be as frosty as they need to be. And Queensland established the multi-agency threat assessment team, which was to inform chemical, biological, radiological phenomena through time. 9-11, obviously, we know about that, but 
Also, the white powder copycat letters that were sent around Australia and other parts of the, the globe since then. Again, there was a focus on zoonotic disease issues, zoonotic transmissions, weapons of mass destruction, uh, 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 mass destruction, I should say, related to animal disease coming across to humans. Chogham too, in Queensland, the multi-agency threat assessment team was put into operation in real time. A kilogram of sodium cyanide had been stolen from a gold mine in Perth, and a month before this particular event, there was a bomb found under the Elysee Palace in Paris where sodium cyanide was attached to an explosive device. The goal was volatilising cyanide gas from that explosion into the palace. So, Queensland Police decided if that kilogram of sodium cyanide could make its way across to Brisbane, north of Brisbane, there was a, an issue. So, Queensland, federal, uh, activi uh, federal agencies as well, obviously, stood up their multi-agency threat assessment team and did a rapid threat assessment. They determined that the threat was real, but the risk of actually making sure that they could get that sodium cyanide into the Chogham space was minimal. The critical thing is there was a capability based on the authorising environment through time where rapid decision making could be made and there were mechanisms for that to occur. Again, we have ASPE being launched in 2002 and I, and I, I must say I enjoyed my five years with ASPE and I continue to work with the ASPE team from time to time. The Bali bombing, of course, critical issues in terms of uh, uh, Commissioner Kelty's relationship with the Indonesian counterparts, the Federal Police. As a result of all of that, we have the OSMAT teams uh, activated. We have them as a capability for the government that is continuing and sustained. We have the, the National Critical Care Trauma Centre in Darwin. We have a range of capacities that have been tested but pre-enabled by relationships in terms of our region. We also had the Trusted Sharing Information Network created in 2004, again part of the authorising environment of capability development based on decision making and learning. What did we learn? We learned that, you know, certainly Mike Rothery, uh, now no longer with us in his creation, the innovative combination of private and public sector information coming together in a trusted sharing context to give effect to decisions made ahead of time, but also to create new decision options. A, a critically important thing that is still with us currently. Certainly the 2004 tsunami, a range of partnership arrangements were subsequently uh, enabled with Indonesia, with Australia. And one of the interesting elements we had in 2005, a national security advisor uh, within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Duncan Lewis, and his deputy, the current Chief of Defence. One of the actions that came from that particular uh, creation of opportunity based on decisions and learning was a commission to ASPE to do an international benchmarking study on national risk assessment techniques and approaches. And it was my privilege to run that particular investigation or research project. But the critical thing that came from that is that there were a range of information flows that came back into Premier and Cabinet through the National Security Advisor about what options could be taken in the country. And the critical thing there for me is that without the authorising environment being, uh, being uh, agile in the, in the way in which the government was operating, we would never have had a national security advisor or a deputy national security advisor and that notion of what could go wrong, how could we prepare for that and what mitigation options do we have, we would never have had that study. One small brick in a wall supporting national capability. And in that sense, I think, do governments learn? Yes and no. But what is more important, do governments have curiosity and do they investigate options and I think one of the elements that I have discovered from working towards this point in this presentation is the notion of stability match fitness experience at the cabinet level to allow specialists to inform decision making and that is a critical thing in my view in terms of national security national risk management capability is the stability and the authorizing environment that comes from 
a stable government. Thank you.